Welcome to the show. In focus today is Paris, the city that hosted the just concluded United Nations Conference on Climate Change. Je regarde euh, la salle, je vois que la réaction est positive, je n'entends pas d'objection. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. It is known as the city of light in a nation that is recognized as the most visited country in the world. We will tell you why. Also in this program, is it easy to live in Paris? Maxwell Kimani, a Kenyan athlete living in the city, will tell us his experience. Plus, some good news for Kenyans from the Paris-based United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization. Mwaka huu, uh, isukuti, ilikubalika na shirika la UNESCO. This and more from Paris, but first, here are the highlights of the just concluded conference on climate change. Je regarde uh, la salle, je vois que la réaction est positive, je n'entends pas d'objection. L'accord de Paris pour le climat est accepté. The deal comes into effect in the year 2020. The main goal is to limit the rise in global temperatures to less than 2 degrees Celsius. It was agreed that all countries must act to halt deforestation and degradation and improve land management. A key milestone is a commitment by rich nations to mobilize 100 billion US dollars or the equivalent of about 10 trillion Kenya shillings a year in climate finance for developing countries by the year 2020 with a commitment to further finance in the future. This is the first ever deal to cut carbon emissions as the past talks have ended up in disagreements. We're looking at how can we reduce emissions in, indust in, in industries, how can we reduce emissions in manufacturing, how can we reduce emissions in transport. The deal is partly legally binding and partly voluntary. Some aspects of the agreement will be legally binding, such as submitting an emissions reduction target and the regular review of that goal. However, the targets set by nations will not be binding under the deal struck in Paris. Each nation had delivered their national action plans before the conference. Some of the sector-wide voluntary domestic measures and actions to address climate change include expansion, in geothermal, solar and wind, and other renewables and clean energy. Close to two-thirds of our power generation is at present green. Progress towards achieving and maintaining a tree cover of at least 10% of our country's land area, where we currently stand at 7.2%, and low carbon and efficient transportation system. In the last seven years, we've made ambitious investments in clean energy and ambitious reductions in our carbon emissions. We've multiplied wind power threefold, solar power more than 20-fold, helping create parts of America where these clean power sources are finally cheaper than dirtier conventional power. World leaders hailed the draft as a milestone in the battle to keep the Earth a planet that is hospitable to human life. But there are those who caution that there is still a mountain to climb now that the agreement has been passed in Paris, it's up to individual countries to approve the agreement back home and strengthen the national actions triggered by the agreement. So we are here. The deal set 2018 as a critical global moment for countries to come back to the table and take stock of their current efforts in relation to this global goal. And this should result in stronger and enhanced actions on emissions reductions, finance and adaptation. That is at global level. Now, let's narrow this to an angle closer to Kenyans. And the question is, what does Kenya take home from the climate conference? Funding, for example, some of our projects on low emission, uh, funding some of our, our projects on improving transportation, funding some of our projects on renewable energy, and so on. What we have done as a country is to present ourselves here very strategically. If you compare to many nations, we have a climate change response strategy. We have a climate change bill that has just gone through the 
third reading in the Senate. We have presented ourselves as we are ready to implement our INDC. If anything, we are already implementing our INDC. So we are in pole position for getting some of this funding. One memorable aspect of the Climate Change Conference in Paris is that the city, in collaboration with conference organizers, used the occasion to display the advantages of modern public transport system in relation to climate change. This is how. As delegates, we had free access to the public transport system from the buses, trams, and even underground trains, also known as the metro. This was part of efforts to promote the use of public transport, which is considered to be environment friendly. An efficient public transport system leads to lesser use of personal vehicles, hence decongesting cities and reducing fumes that contribute to global warming. This is a practical lesson from France. Participants in the climate change conference would be taking back home as part of urgent measures to deal with climate change. You've come to a conference where you want to reduce carbon emissions and then you pollute. So you reduce as much as you possibly can. And this is something that we can do. We've seen border borders increasing throughout. We would say they are electric equivalents. You don't have to use diesel, you don't have to use petrol, but you can use the electric uh, border borders. So it affects all of us, it affects all ordinary Kenyans, and most importantly, it affects their health. Let's now hear from a Kenyan who lives in Paris. Is life easy in the city as compared to life back home? I met Maxwell Kimani, an athlete who makes a living through running and instructing aspiring athletes. He says living standards are very high in the city and you would be in for a rude shock if you expected better life with, say, five times what you earn in Kenya. Because here you come, you win a, a lot of money, like 100,000 Kenya money, which is good. When someone didn't come out, living the living standards are, are very high. You need to pay, pay house like uh, six, 60,000 mm -hmm. Kenya money. You need to pay your bill, you need to pay tax, you need to pay your, uh, your transport, which is very expensive. If you have idea, you can get a job, 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 you can get open sio kama mtu wako nyumbani hajaitoka lakini also ukikuja hapa kama student jua kitu yenye inakuleta kwa sababu unaweza fanya kitu yenye haita kusaidia ukirudi nyumbani na itakuwa waste and then ni vizuri watu waelewe ngambo ikungangana hapa usiku na mchana tuna tunajitolea ingawa wakenya wengi wenye wako nyumbani wananisikia wajue wasifikie huku tunakujanga kuchuna pesa juu ya miti huko ni kazi ngumu tunakuja huko tunafanya kazi kwa bidii mchana na usiku on that note we take a quick break when we return the sights and sounds of paris and why it is known as the city of light also ahead the paris based united nations educational scientific and cultural organization unesco has recognized Kenya's Isukuti as an art worth preserving. We will tell you what this means. Stay with us.
Pari is situated on the Seine River in the north of the country. Together with eight suburbs, the whole agglomeration has a population of 10.5 million according to the January 2012 population census. Paki is called the city of light because it was a place of enlightenment in the 18th century. During this age of enlightenment, the city became the center of education, philosophy and learning. Government records show that another reason Paris is called the city of light is because it was one of the first cities to start using streetlights during the Great Exhibition of 1889. Having streetlights meant people could now do activities after dark that they could not do before. The streets suddenly grew safer. Some sections of the city are abuzz with hawkers and one notable thing is a mix of races with a majority of the black community being those from former French colonies. Government figures show that in 2014, Paris received 22.4 million visitors, making it one of the world's top tourist destinations. The Eiffel Tower is one of the key tourist attractions. The tower is named after the engineer Gustave Eiffel, whose company designed and built the tower. It was constructed in 1889 and has become a global cultural icon of France and one of the most recognizable structures in the world. The tower is the tallest structure in Paris and the most visited paid monument in the world. About 7 million people ascended it in 2011. Statistics further show that the tower by 2010 had received 250 million visitors. The tower is 324 meters tall, about the same height as an 81-story building. Now, Paris is the home of some of the most visited museums in the world. One of the most notable architectural landmarks is the Notre Dame Cathedral. Then there is La Défense, a major business district of the Paris metropolitan area. It is Europe's largest purpose-built business district with 72 glass and steel buildings, of which 18 are completed skyscrapers. It has 180,000 daily workers and 3.5 million square meters of office space. Kenya's ambassador to the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, Professor George Godia, says Kenya could borrow a leaf from France in terms of preserving and marketing its heritage for tourism purposes. One of the key things UNESCO is engaged in promoting tourism, which is in line with our current foreign policy, is to ensure that we inscribe more sites from our country into the World Heritage List. Right now we have about six sites uh, inscribed. Mount Kenya, we have the Lake Turkana Lake System, the Rift Valley Lake System, the Mijikenda, the Kayas, the Fort Jesus. We have uh, on list Timli Chohinga in Nyanza, which we hope will be inscribed soon. Because if we can inscribe more sites into the, into the World Heritage List, then we are able to uh, we are able to um, promote tourism and also safeguard uh, our cultural heritage. You will have noticed in France here, for example, the Eiffel Tower here is one of the greatest income earners for Paris. So this is what we hope to do here in, within the, the UNESCO framework. And on a much lighter note, some good news from the organization. <laughs> The Isukuti dance of the Idaho and Luya communities has been recognized by the UN body. Isukuti is used in various ceremonies, including weddings, sports, political events, funerals, and in Idaho and Isuka during bullfighting festivities. The Isukuti is one of the UNESCO inscribed uh, in cultural tangible uh, 
intangible heritage and I did sign the certificate and sent to the Ministry of Culture early this year. What does that mean exactly? It means that uh, it is um, a value that has been recognized internationally and therefore it is important that it be protected and it be promoted and we will be working with the Ministry of Culture, Ministry of Foreign Affairs to ensure that this becomes a, a real attraction, a real pride among other intangible cultural uh, heritages that we have. So our job here is to expand these uh, frameworks. Josphat Amwai is the leader of Imirembe Group.